Camille Nanjani's in it and you know, Finn Wolfhard. And then James you've got the old... Caster. James A. Caster's in it as well. I, I need silence. I, I, took, I saw the ghosts <laughs> and I put them away. I shot the movie yeah. and now it's done. Saw the ghosts, had a had panic attack, <laughs> bon appetit. <laughs> He actually, well, he actually doesn't do that. He doesn't. Yeah. But he should have done. <laughs> he should have done. <laughs> Are you going to call? Right, yeah. Ghostbusters. That's what I think. <laughs> Scary creatures. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> might like to know our listeners is that we go to a lot of preview screenings we go to a lot to a lot of film screenings you know ahead of time you know you get the invitation then like come to a just you know a location in soho it's at a weeknight a certain time. screening totally and what i'm learning is there is a real like um broad spectrum of what you can expect from a screening mm. right sometimes you turn up and you're like at one end of the spectrum it's like it's the Soho screening rooms. Yeah, yeah. There are no refreshments. You go 25 in. 25 seats. 25 so, seats, quite close together. Yeah. And uh, that screening I went to yesterday, bloke just stood basically right in front of the screen, well, just off from the screen, mm. just like watching everyone to make sure no one like gets their phone out. Yeah. There's that. And then sometimes you turn up to like similar kind of setup, but it's at Posh Hotel. Yeah. And you go down and, it, and if you're lucky, Some there drinks. might be water, maybe a bag of popcorn. A Moscow um, Mule. But, but well, no, that's the next one up, I'd say. Oh, so, fine, I think, yeah. so this one is like usually when it's still quite pressy. And then the next one up from that is like Soho Posh House. Hotel. Yeah, Soho House. <laughs> yeah. Definitely a refreshment. Definitely something, a bit of bag, bag of popcorn on your on your chair. Someone you're like, are they famous? Are yeah. They famous? Are they my friend? Were they in that TV show? And then you go to the really big ones at like Leicester Square oh, or nice. Odeon West End. And yeah. it's like, you've got the same generic brand of popcorn so they, they did, they, there. There's a warehouse somewhere where these film companies just have all the popcorn that they use for these film yeah, screeners. And the, and the popcorn is usually fairly stale. It's and it's mi- been mixed. Uh, and a can of water. That's what you get. You get a can, can of, water of water and a bag of popcorn. Sweet water, and salty. Water and something that just isn't a plastic bottle. It could be a carton, yes. can. Yeah, it's never plastic. No plastic. Which is quite good, I suppose. Not only environmentally, but also during a film. Just like... Yeah. Anyway, and then last week we had a different one where we turned up to the Odeon West End you know, where they have all the premiere screenings and stuff, yeah. the huge venue, the, the the flagship Odeon venue. Yeah. Two We've, tiers. Yeah, yeah, the balcony the area style. for, um, it's like a, it's basically like a double auditorium, isn't it really? Because yeah. you think about all the seats they've got upstairs. Nice seats as well. Nice seats. Uh, Odeon, yes, West, West, West End. And um, we go see Ghostbusters, Frozen Empire, which we'll be reviewing in the bonus this week. Yeah. Um, and they, no, you walk in, not only are there drinks on a table, you yeah. know, wine, beer, etc. But you get to your chair and there is, as described, the giant pack of popcorn yeah. and the can of water, but also an elite, giant, mutant size of Monster Munch. And these are the big Monster Munches. So it's like biting into in it. Mouth. It's like eating a styrofoam apple <laughs> doused in pickled onion. You're like, oh, gosh. The, yeah. s- the smell. Wow, yeah. So firstly, oh no, firstly the sound. Oh yeah, right. right. So there's, the there's sound 700 of, people in there? Yes, yeah, hundreds of people in this room. Everyone has got... A massive bag of Monster Munch. What yeah. is easily Monster Munch for three people yes. is on each seat. Yeah. I'm not proud to say I had two entire bags oh, did. during that whole film because <laughs> there's nothing really else to do but just consume Monster Munch yeah. until I started falling asleep. Um, but yeah, and then so you walk in, the smell is pickled onion yeah. and the sound in the first, what, 30, 40 minutes of the Couldn't film? Hear anything, yeah. Just... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was incredible and it's the, astonishing you do know that at like a, a micro level like there's just um a pickled onion monster munch dust oh, just, just floating through the, the air, air. No, it smelled like the back of a school bus yeah you know right deep in the seats crumbs On a school everywhere. trip everyone's popping their crisps yeah. I, I was surprised that like there weren't more people sort of getting up from the aisles and being like <laughs> insane it's not like I had so much you know when like they cut the inside lining of your yes. mouth and like I had this like raw, like I burnt my mouth yeah this raw feeling of just this mush crisp mush dentist finding it like two years though. later they like, like wow like, yeah. <laughs> look at that that's one of it's just a ghost it's a ghost <laughs> yeah, it's burning it out <laughs> Um, also, what I find interesting is that sometimes you, know, you eat food. You are a human yeah, being, yeah, yeah. and often we'll eat. Often it's I'll say, "Oh, let's get some lunch." 
you're yeah. going, yeah, okay, we'll eat. Yeah. But sometimes you're like, no, no, I don't want to eat. You know, I'm cool. Yeah. Whatever, you know, what you do you. Yeah. But then but then you go and put away go for two it. bags of monster and some yeah. popcorn as well. Yeah. And then you were like, oh, I felt a bit sleepy in that movie. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I wonder why. I really can put food away. Like when I, so, so I, I don't like to eat before a podcast. I, 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 I'm much better. My brain is far better when I fasted. And just like generally in my day, if I can avoid eating for, for, for big days, I won't do it. But obviously like that completely goes out the window if I'm on holiday or yeah. if I've got any cool food experience, right. I'll always and do it. Monster so, Munch counts as that. Like, monster Munch counts as a cool food experience, but like, I get to work, I get to like shoot really great food for my yeah. work and I'll always eat oh, yeah. like the food that's there because it's amazing. But just like generally I, don't, I try not to eat, but like when I do choose to eat, sometimes man, I just take do. it. I really go for it. Or like yeah. the food I make myself, I can just I can really just kind of oscillate between the extremes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I, mean I can too, but, but like, but you know, like I, 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 I just like boasting. And also because I've seen the luxury food you get on your work dues, and then yeah, like yeah. you're like, yeah, two bags of monster. Oh, munch. monster munch. Yeah, straight away. <laughs> put that. It's because I have not eaten all day, and I'm yeah. like, okay, well here we are for Ghostbusters. I might as well just put down all of it. Add popcorn as well. James eat, James's eating habits not endorsed by a doctor, by the way. Please no. eat however you eat. Yeah, however you um, choose to eat. Yeah. <laughs> James in a minute's left. <laughs> yeah. It's also endorsed by the evidence of George after he has a cheesy, cheesy pasta. I don't usually eat before a thing anymore. But you'll eat during, you'll eat during an episode. If it's a late one. Yeah. And I don't, yeah. when, now I'm full time, I don't need yeah. to do that anymore. But like, yeah, in the, the evening. The effect of use, <laughs> the, the hair goes a bit <laughs> askew, the eyes start drooping. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but no, we're, you know, still. Yeah. Don't anyway, want to be one of those wanky intermittent fasters on on the internet talking about it, but it, it, there is something to it. I've found personally, anecdotally. So. Everyone, do your own research. Do though. your own thing. Anyway, welcome to episode <laughs> 121. 21? It is 121. 121. 121. One, two, palindrome. One, two, one of. G- I was about to say Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. It's not the episode. <laughs> Thank God it's not. Let's do it again. Welcome to episode 121 of Pulp Kitchen. Mm. And we have two double bills for you basically this yeah. week. This main episode, we've got a horror double bill. Yeah. James has seen two horror films. James, what are they? Immaculate, starring Sydney Sweeney. This time, she's a nun. <laughs> uh, and then also Late Night with the Devil. Mm. And then in the bonus episode this week, we're doing a double bill of an 80s reboot double bill. So we'll be talking about... Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. And we'll also be talking about Roadhouse with, with Jake, Jake Gyllenhaal. Gyllenhaal and Conor McGregor bravely in so much more mm. of that film than I, I wouldn't have put that much Conor McGregor in my film, but I, we'll, I'll get on to like it. Like when you go to season something and the lid falls <laughs> off and you've got, oh shit, <laughs> he's just there. Like, let's go, man. We've yeah. got so much Conor McGregor yeah. in this. George, the short film is back. Is well, it 90 like minutes? Short, 84 minutes <gasps> and 94 minutes, like 86 and 94 minutes, the two films from this horror episode. Oh, wow. It's just great. so, it's such a great uh, nudge to go and see something. I was like, well, oh yeah, I'll go see Lena. How much? 84 minutes. <laughs> when we talk about Ghostbusters, we'll, we will talk about how that film's only an hour 44, but it did feel a bit longer than I that. I was thankful it was only an hour 44. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, th- th- it wouldn't be n- weird for that to be 2.20, 2.30. Yeah, yeah, but thank goodness they, they trimmed it down, but it was a long hour 44. That was long. It's like Killers of the Flower Moon long. <laughs> yeah, yeah, literally. <laughs> really was. Um, anyway, so that's what's happening today. Also, we have an exciting little middle point in this episode. So last week, we, we, Pop Kitchen, got to do our first ever media junket, press junket, which is basically mm. where, you know, you're invited to speak to the talent of an, of an upcoming film slash TV show. I've seen them before. In this case, it was Netflix's new TV series, Three Body Problems, starring... Benedict Wong, Isa Gonzalez, Jonathan Price, Liam Cunningham, and much more. An ensemble cast, the new TV show from DB Vice and Benny Benioff, Off. you know, the, day, yeah. the the Game of Thrones guys. And Benedict Wong, who follows us he on does. social media, which we're quite happy to be followed by an Avenger. Yeah. But, uh, I walked he also in the, follows four and a half thousand people. Yes, exactly. So when I walked in the room and I could see that he had no recognition of who I was, I was like, I'm not going to force it. Not we're still going to take the fact that Benedict Wong was actually too polite on the day yes, to yes. say that he's a massive fan. So uh, anyway, <laughs> we go to this hotel and uh, it's very much like Hugh Grant in Notting Hill, yes. writing for Horse and Hound. But uh, we got, I mean, uh, James was unavailable, but I was, had the opportunity to speak to Jonathan Price and Clips several other mem- yeah, some members, mem- members of the cast. And what we're going to do, we're going to put all our footage from that in a separate clip. We can watch all the interviews compiled in a, mm. in a clip that's going to go on the main channel. But we've included a little excerpt that's going to go in uh, today, a little insert about it, it, just like three minutes, just give you guys a little taste. Um, there's also plenty of clips from the interviews going out on social media as well. So that was that. Also, some people have already written in about Three Body Problem, letting me know their thoughts. I didn't realize mm. it was like three books. It's a massive thing. It's out there. So that's going to be a little taste as well in the middle. I knew about the three body problem sort of concept 
for my late well, night. Well, you say that. Sorry, can I? Yeah, you, you, I when, you, when, you, when you explained it to me, and yeah. then when I watched the show, I was yeah, like, "This is really not what James <laughs> <laughs> explained." <laughs> yeah, uh, I know about the three body problem because I, I, I said on the show I, I, I listened to like yes. uh, science videos, how big is the universe, theories, quantum stuff, and, and, and like bits of it go into my brain, but also like I have very much like a partial understanding of it because I've been falling asleep throughout. I'm gonna, I will explain but it to you. I was like, you. yes, of course, the three body problem is this, this and this. But I'm gonna do it off air in case it spoils anything about what oh, I believe the three body issue is. Fine, okay. Probably not relating to like, the whole Isaac Newton thing. No, it's, yeah, um, but we'll get to that we'll anyway. To <laughs> that's happening later, but let's talk horror. Let's do horror double bill. Let's then we'll do some emails as ever and some games. This is, if this is your first Pop Kitchen episode as well, welcome, welcome. settle down. Let's have a nice little film chat. So Late Night with the Devil, mm. a new horror film that's just come out. George, 86 minute runtime. What a cracking Don't little just love to tasty. see it. I just want to pick it up and eat it. Done. 86 and done. Yeah. The famous saying goes. Uh, there's a funny story that just came out, uh, I think yesterday, was that on Sunday, this film took $666,666 at the box office. Whoa. 666666, Late Night with the Devil. Spooky. I don't know if that's like marketing, because the chances of that happening, really low, but also quite fun, yeah. considering, the, considering the subject matter. Uh, written and directed by Cameron and Colin Cairns, who I assume are brothers, but I didn't research that. Uh, 86 minute runtime, which is fantastic. Uh, the film is an almost semi-found footage master tape of a live TV show that was broadcast and aired in 1977 on Halloween night, right? Mm -hmm. So it plays out. Uh, it's, it's very, like, imagine this time with Alice, Alan Partridge. Yes. So you've got the live segments oh, yeah, yeah. and we're off and then you've got the bits in between meets The Exorcist. <laughs> that's basically what this Lynn, is. Lynn, her head's spinning round. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there is sort of a real air, and I'm not the first person to say this, of lots of people comparing it to Alan Partridge. Yeah. Like um, the character Jack Delroy is a little bit of a fumbling buffoon, just desperately trying to cling on to some sort of structure of the yeah. show. But super Alan Partridge. And then you obviously add like the horror, the horror concert of The Exorcist is in there. So Jack Delroy is played by David Dusmartian. He's the most vampiric looking actor ever. Mm. He's I, not a vampire in this. I would say he, I'm glad he's getting a lead role because he's already he's ca always character been actor in lots of stuff. Wonderfully creepy in lots of different things. And yeah, he's, but do you know what I mean? Just, he's, re he's vampire ready. Yeah, he is. No, yeah. Like minimal makeup. Why is he not a dra like a Dracula? Like a Dracula. Mm. Nosferatu even. Mm. He's just ready to be a vampire. He's no, not no, a vampire. Yeah, no offense, David. <laughs> yeah, no offense, David. Yeah. You've got a wonderfully like sort of um, pale but dark hair. And, yeah. uh, anyway. Him and Rami Malek could be like vampire brothers. Oh, that'd be great. A little, a little hello, team up hello. vampire movie. <laughs> Both of them just being so awkward and weird in a, in a haunted house in Transylvania. Someone, someone do that. Uh, he plays uh, Jack Delroy, who is a late night TV show host who is desperate to revive his career with a spooky Halloween special. It is the, it is sweeps week in America, which is a phrase I've heard many times, but I don't really know what it means. So it's like- Bruce Almighty, that's all I know. Yeah, <laughs> sweeps week. Not during sweeps week. It's basically week. like the end of the TV year and all of the commissioners are gonna decide who gets basically the next allocation of right. advertising and show. So everyone tends to go all out for this week and they book the biggest things they can to boost their numbers to be in the best position for the following year. That's kind of why I understand it. Um, and it starts basically, before we get into this sort of master tape of, the inter of what the film plays out, as we start with this almost like a 10, 15 minute profile on Jack Delroy and his TV career, his rise to fame, uh, having previously enjoyed success, but he was never ever able to overtake Johnny Carson, who in the 1970s was the yeah. king of late night and no one could ever beat him. Uh, it also covers him losing his wife uh, to cancer, him taking a break from TV and also him returning and the effect that that had from him and the fact that his show sort of consistently has struggled to, to keep an audience. Um, and his show is called Night Owls with, Jack Delroy. And so for this Halloween special, he's got one of those, um, I've forgotten the name of it, but it's like a, a vertical wire that makes that wee, theremin. Wee, theremin. He's got one of those sounds and, you know, his his light, his big band and his comedian is playing with this. Wee, yeah. And of course, obviously that ends up being, you have to yeah. basically put a hand near it to yeah, make yeah, it yeah. make sound. And obviously that's going to, that's going to kick off later in the show. Uh, and so on his show today, he is, a, he has invited a parapsychologist who has done a case study on a young teen who is the sole survivor of a satanic church's mass suicide. Wow. They were fans of the occult and were contacting the dead. And this teen, this teenage girl, obviously horror movie, uh, claims to have a demon inside her and they are coming on the show. 
Also, you have a man called the wonderful Christo, oh. who claims he can speak to the dead, and he does that classic. Um, you, I'm, I'm getting the name um, uh, Christy, Kristen, uh, Chris. Yes, you had a brother once who died, like that very sort of yeah, classic, yeah, yeah. Lead, lead, leading the audience onto a thing. Uh, he claims he can speak to the dead and has mixed results. And he is also uh, joined by a, uh, a sort of Darren Brown-esque illusionist who has committed his career to debunking anything to do with the paranormal, anything to do with contacting the dead. He has a real sort of um, thespian's voice where he's like, Jack, this is clearly a fraud, a fabrication. This yeah. man is no more of a liar than the blah, blah, blah. And he sort of very like proves that he could do all the same tricks that this guy can. It's all fake, blah, blah, blah. Um, so, You've got this sort of these three guests on the show all battling for attention, all with their own segment, and things as the show gets on, it evolves and it builds. Yeah. Things get spookier and spookier. Even members of the crew start saying, I don't want to be here anymore. This is getting Ooh. weird. We should stop. Body parts, guts, Ooh. things, all sorts of stuff goes wrong. But we uh there's this incentive to keep the show going. It's a live TV show, so we can't break it. We need this for Sweeps Week. He's got his slimy producer in the background being like, This is gonna be great. Cigarettes. Is there any other kind? Uh, <laughs> is there any other kind? Like just just cigarettes and this and yeah. you know you Jack, you got you gotta make this happen, hammer up, blah blah blah. So it's this incentive to keep it going. And there's a couple of good moments of humor where, you know, like the camera closes in on Jack Delroy. It's halfway through the show and he goes, well, ladies and gentlemen, what we have seen tonight has been nothing short of phenomenal. It seems as though tonight we are going to make contact with the very devil himself. But not before a brief word from our yeah, sponsors. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, please enjoy these. You messages. sounded like Tom Cruise there. I did a bit. <laughs> yeah, did a bit yeah, yeah. Not a bit, there'll be more Richard, You've never seen me very upset. upset. Um, so a good friend of mine saw this at a film early at a film festival and she said she loved it. She said, definitely go and see it in the cinema. So I did. Um, out of the gate, the recreation of the 70s TV show, the whole production mm. design of it, the way in which the studio cameras have this wonderful dewy, soft glow, the fringing, uh, brilliant. The cinematography wonderfully designed, everything slightly off, that wonderful sense that things that are old are a bit creepier, yes. dusty set, dark, the sort of um, the flats, the facades, mm. things going on behind them really great sense of, of creepiness and the opening introduction to Jack Delroy is like suitably mm. creepy and, and, and black and white. Um, and one of the best things about it is that within 84 minutes, it builds and builds and builds, gets more unsettling, more creepy, things are going wrong, they don't want to stop. Uh, I like how as a horror film, it feels really artistic, it feels really intentionally designed, it's mm. concise, doesn't overstay its welcome, doesn't overcomplicate itself. That being said, it is very simple. I maybe wanted in its third act another, you, you stuck the knife in and yeah. I'd love you to have twisted yeah. it. You know, but then I, I feel like a bit of a hypocrite for saying the other horror films I'm disliking are too complicated and trying to over, yeah. overthink this thing. We'll have like a boss fight at the end. So I like that this sort of didn't try to overdo itself. Yeah. So I'm, I, mean, I am going to sort of bounce in between what, what it what it does. Um, structurally, it's interesting because I, I admire that it commits to this sort of semi-found footage one room setting and that the, the whole film after this intro takes place in this room and it's a recording being played out to you. But um, once I saw the opening profile about Jack Delroy, I did basically predict everything that would happen in the film right. following it. I think that prof I think because it has to play out like one long master tape, it almost became that that introduction was needed and therefore I think gave away too much for what happened at the end. Uh. Doesn't take away from the fact that it's got some very good scares and watching it play out was fun, but I wonder if there was something to gain from losing the sort of found footage yeah. master tape structure and if you could have sort of put the sort of surprised me a little bit more. Mm. That being said, there's a couple of great great scares in it i think the, the final act was good but I, I think you could have just gone yeah. a little a little bit further to make a really good impact um but i think I've, I've wanted to find more horror that feels like really intricately designed and concise and i'm glad that late night with the devil is that and i, I'm, I think it's very good you should go and see it when you said about the the structure the 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 concession to not having that bit at the beginning about the yeah the do you wish they just had the entire thing committed to the the, the conceit and just have the beginning do. to end the master tape. But then you might have to do lots of clunky exposition, yes. like shoved into something that's meant to be yeah. like, like organic conversation. So yes and no. Okay. But you know, what, but that being said, within 86 minutes, my, you know, you, you, I'm not going to complain as much and sure. if you've taken two hours 15 because it, it, it just yeah. achieves to do a couple of great scares in a very short amount of time and it's suit. You leave the audience, you're like, that was creepy. I had a good time. Yeah. Good horror films and good comedies should be tight. 
Yeah. So if I see 86 minutes, if it's a tight 86, that's fine. Yeah, and it's just going to do, this is just the master tape of like a lost show that mm. was aired in the 70s, spooky. I'm like, yeah, it's good, it's good fun. Mm. It's, it's suitably creepy. It's not perfect. It is a bit predictable. Um, there's a lot, there's a lot that uh, other people have said about this song that I think spoils it, and I've been very sort good, of okay. light on on, on sort of Thank the you. premise because I think there's more. Well, you're, you're, I think you're, I think you'll mostly guess what everything right. happens within the first fifteen minutes, but I would still let you guys as an audience find out for yourselves when you see it. Sometimes a film will like uh, unfurl, and it'll be like, uh, and you'll be like, well, I've seen a movie before, so mm. I can already anticipate what's going to happen. I'm like, you have yeah, to lay the track for yeah. things to happen you, later. Yeah. This might be interesting to people who have never watched a film, but yeah. like most people have. Okay, interesting. That was Late Night with the Devil. Yeah, if you've the seen devil. that, um, let us know your thoughts at hello at popkitchenpodcast.com. Did you agree with James? Did you disagree? Let us know. And David S. Malshin's good in it too. He's sort of yeah. uh, like nicely awkward and charismatic in a way that feels quite forceful. Like, you know, when you've seen late night hosts sort of really try and drag an interview mm. and get the best out of it, and you can see they're just hoping but laughing. There's a nice sort of mm. awkwardness to him there. He's quite well cast, I think. At this point, I'm going to mention Three Body Problem again. I introduced it at the beginning of the show, but yes, we had a little conversation with the cast of Netflix's new show, science fiction show. Very sciencey, very knotty, very complex mm. show. If you like science and astrology, yes, I'm getting no astrology and astronomy. Hang on, astronomy. Ooh. Which one's the, which one's the science? Astron astronomy is the science. Astrology, astrology. is the star. Thank science. you. If you like astronomy, then this is for you. Um, I spoke to the, I had about eight minutes with each members of the of the cast. We had a nice conversation. Obviously, there's not enough time to include the whole thing now. But one of the questions I asked them was, what is their favorite science fiction what film? What's your favorite <laughs> science fiction, fiction movie? movie? And they gave a variety of answers, which was very nice. So we're going to play a little clip from that now. And then we'll get back to James's review of Immaculate. And just a reminder, if you want to catch the full conversation, you can do that on the channel and on social media. Roll the tape. Um, good morning, guys. Nice morning, to see morning. you. Morning. Um, so this is a very big show. Big ideas, and I know it's early in the morning, but I want to ask you a big question, which is, do you think there's life on other planets? I'll take that. <laughs> that intake of breath is yeah, where we yeah, begin, no, isn't it? No, like, yeah. But it's about 100 billion stars, or bodies, if we, as we call them, <laughs> in, in our galaxy alone, 100 million of our suns. And there's an estimated, in the visible bit of the universe that we can see, approximately two trillion that's 2,000 billion galaxies. So statistically, mm. it would be incredibly unlikely that there isn't some form of life somewhere in the universe besides mm. our very good selves. Mm. I, l I like the question what they're asking, whether on the pale blue dot, whether there's intelligent life form there. On Earth? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wonder that myself sometimes, yeah. actually. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I agree. I think it's a numbers game. There's probably yeah. a good chance that it's out there. Okay. Obviously, this is like science fiction at all levels. It's epic, but it also has the kind of cerebral problem-solving element of science fiction. I would just love to know, what are some of your favourite science fiction films? Blade Runner. 100%. Yeah. 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 We've had this. We had this chat amongst ourselves. Mm -hmm. It's magnificent. Mm. And it stands up. <clears throat> and even though Blade Runner happens before today, is it mm. 2020, I think uh, it was? 2019. 2019, 2019. Yes. five yeah. years wow. ago. Yeah. <laughs> Blade Runner is set. That's yes. how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> if you think about it, it's not. No, but I'm not tempted to say Sunshine. Oh, I mean, am I allowed to... <laughs> I love you, can yeah. Thank you. you can do self-nods. I'll reel off my own. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sunshine's of course a good one. Yeah, I think that's good. Yeah. I love Sunshine. Thank um, you. What are your favorite science fiction films? The 2001, yeah. Has to be. I mean, it's one of the one of the best films. Sort of set the template, really. Mm. Set 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 a lot of the kind of visual motifs. The thing about it is that, that it, it, I think it's quite a cold film. All of his films. All of his films lack. I feel like he doesn't like me as an audience. Probably. No, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> all of his films lack a certain warmth, and I th I think that film is so immersive in so much as it takes you away. Like, like, like while you, I think I think you're a changed person while you're watching it. It's like you lose contact with everything nice about your life <laughs> yeah. for a while. Yeah. And I think that he's, he's very, very good at that. And, you know, arguably the greatest filmmaker of all time. And if he's made a science fiction film, mm. he's probably stands a good chance of being the best one. Yeah, it, it, it's, it taps into the existential dread so effectively. Mm. You can kind of feel that he was, I mean, he was a bit of a dick, wasn't he? But um, you can you can feel that in two thousand one. 
Yeah. Very palpable. It works very well for that. It kind of works for all of them because they're all quite... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're, I mean, I love them, but there's, they're, they're pretty, there's a pretty sinister, cold through line there. Yes, yeah. Oh, Arrival is probably my... Great, yes. Uh, I think it's just beautiful because that um, is at the heart of it, a story about grief. Mm. And then there's also, like, mm, science fiction alien elements, mm -hmm. but um, I love those ones. I love the show Black Mirror. Sorry, you just said one. No, no, <laughs> yeah, 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 give, give me more, it's fine. I just yeah, love yeah, yeah. when it's, um, I'm much more into the, the kind of fiction that's so similar to our world, mm. and it just extends things like either technology or, or some aspect of our world, and twists it to the point where it could go, and you could imagine mm. that happening, like in the near future, because it makes it so much more palpable and more engaging, in mm. my opinion. Mm. So yeah. Do you have any? Yes, for me, I want to share one that's a Chinese movie. And I, and I feel very proud of them that they can make this movie. It's about uh, investigation center of the universe. Mm. They set up an investigation center on Earth to uh, invest the universe. It's called Yuzhou Tansu Bian Ji Bu. Oh. I, 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 I don't think they have an English. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> yeah. But they made me so proud because I really enjoyed it. it it's, uh, it's a form of uh, mostly a false documentary because okay. mostly it's based on uh, imagination. Yes. But it was so funny. Yeah. Yeah. I wish it's longer. Because yeah. you have seen sci science fiction movie for like three hours, right? Yeah. Or four, mm. or they slip into two parts of the movies. Mm. But yeah. that was like, I hope it's longer. And I thought the theory was so completed. Yes. Mm. Yeah, the physics. I want to watch it now. Yeah, 宇宙探索编辑部. I will have to check that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I need to get that. It's we'll get a note later. Uh, 2001. Mm. Uh, that was uh, that was a great experience watching that film. Um, again, because of the, the scope of it. It was huge, but uh, it wasn't. There weren't too many mm. weird aliens talking about. <laughs> I had a, a, a claim that I'd uh, I'd never seen Star Wars, and I hadn't for a long time. Yes. And then I worked with Adam Driver, ah. and I thought I'd better watch one. And I, <laughs> I regret I can no longer say yeah. I've never seen Star Wars. <laughs> there you go. There you go. What a lovely bunch of people they were. That was sweet. I like that. Yeah, thank you very much. Cute. They seem lovely. So let's get back into spooky season. The spooky mm. double bill. James, Immaculate. So yeah, Immaculate, starring Sydney Sweeney. Sydney Sweeney, uh, probably in too much at the moment now, probably in too many things, but we thought she was great in reality. Yes. She's great in The White Lotus a couple of yes. years ago. Solid fun in Anyone But You, not the best film, but like she, good was, euphoria. she was good in it. Yeah, great in Euphoria. Um, this is a horror thriller. Mm. Uh, Sweeney plays Cecilia, who heads to Italy in a time period that is old, but not not uh, specified. Okay. So like, unclear when it's set, but like the past. There's no iPhones. Basically, okay. I think could that's it just... be? Are we talking like '90s or like '60s? It's it's written not. I'd say mm, I'm leaning towards '70s, but like you oh, could okay. you could throw a dart anywhere in the 20th century, I and I'd, I'd have to believe okay. you. Basically, um, she plays Cecilia, who's driving to Italy, heading to a nun. Oh, there's a, be there's a wonderfully creepy horror prologue with Simona Tabasco, who is in uh, White Lotus oh, yes. season two, who's great. And uh, yeah, she's we get the sense that this is she's a nun, is trying to escape from uh, the convent, and she's running away, and these scary old oh. nuns come after her. And um, she manages to get like her body through the gate, yeah. but they grab her yeah, leg yeah. and then they snap it off ah! from the gate. They're like, ah, let's, let's go. Uh, so it's, it's clearly, this is not a place to be. Everyone, people are trying to leave. Uh, and this is, sorry, I'm just, I'm sorry if this is in your little notes, mm. but I, I know that Sydney Sweeney's been trying to make this movie for like years. She's a producer on it, and yes. I think it's a passion project for she, her. She said interesting. she got the script when she was like 16 or 18, and, okay. like, and, and like she was trying to make it for every year. She And then it has her star ascended yeah and i think it was when she was on the set of the white lotus that she was like i think i'm gonna make this myself now because no one's picking this up oh cool and uh, that'd be fun to have the power to do that um uh, yeah, yeah i mean 60 this is an 18 right yeah. and i'm really deserving of an 18 oh so good i love the 18 it came up it. and like i saw it with my cousin we both said oh 18 strong bloody eyes yeah. what is that? it totally earns 18 no non-adults should see this film like my god <laughs> 
really taken aback by how much of an 18 it was. Anyway, uh, Cecilia goes to Italy, uh, heading to a nun convent. She's an American coming from, I think, Chicago, uh, to take her vows and to serve there. Um, it's immediately creepy. Uh, she's shown around uh, this place, and some of the nuns have got, the older nuns have deteriorated mental conditions, and they have cross-shaped scars mm. on their feet. Um, they have sort of first church mass with like sort of the head priest is there and there's a there's a wonderful creepy beauty in the ceremony of of religion mm. like it's such an it's such an low-hanging fruit for for horror yeah. obviously but there's something quite impressive scary and intimidating mm. about the church and sort of the order of it and the structure and sort of the mm. uh, the frailty of the nuns to the imposing visage of god and mm. christ himself it's all just sort of quite quite nicely cinematic in that sense uh, in the basement of in the catacombs they claim to have an actual nail from the crucifixion of Christ. Of course they do. Uh, one of the nails that this, and you know, therefore it's 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 important. <laughs> <laughs> therefore, nicely that's, summarized. That's yeah. cool for people who you know who are into that. Who are into that? <laughs> um, Anyone want a nail from the crucifixion? <laughs> yeah. A bit of a wood. And it's a real too. rusty sort yeah. of. You know, it's got a couple oh. of Turin shrouds. Sorry, all of that. Uh, uh, so things are seem to be creepy. She's got a very sort of austere single bed room, um, late night wanderings. She then discovers that she's uh, she's experiences some morning sickness, uh, goes to the doctor, they do some tests, and it realizes that she's actually pregnant. Ooh. She's taken to almost like in a headmaster setting to the um, to the head priest and the head nun, this other guy. And they ask her very blankly, you know, uh, are you are you chaste? Have you broken your vows? Are you true to your vows? Did you lay with the man before you came? Has anyone interacted with you here? Blah blah blah. And she's like, swears, like, why are you asking me this? Like, no, of course, I've never. I I, I have poverty. I want for nothing. I am chaste. I am this. I'm committed to God. Um, and so all of them look at each other and. The next logical step is that oh my god, this is an immaculate conception. Uh. Immaculate. Uh, this is an immaculate conception. Sound the alarm. Whoa. Oh my God. This clearly is a, a message from, from God. Um, and therefore, she, she's learning that she's pregnant. Um, she is pregnant. And this has now obviously completely changed her position in the convent. All of the women are receiving her very differently now. There's sort of a sense that others feel like it should have been them. There's, uh, she's now washed and bathed very carefully by others. When she walks in the room, everyone else stands because she is carrying the child of... Of, of Christ, um, some of them are very hostile. Yes. There's sort of very sort of challenging scenes with the other women of multiple ages. Uh, Sydney Sweeney has this uh, overriding sense that something is not right, that something is wrong, something is not feeling how it should. She's desperate to go to a proper hospital for a checkup. They have a sort of church doctor there yeah. who sort of has equipment and is capable, but she's like, I'd really like to go to a proper hospital. But uh, they are very keen to not let her leave. They don't want her to leave. You don't want to go to hospitals. They're full of infections and nasty diseases. It's not right. You're better off staying here. Uh, you're safer here, blah, blah, blah. She becomes more and more a prisoner in this place, a prisoner of her own body, a prisoner of this religion and a prisoner of this entire place that's forcing her to stay where she is. Mm. This whole idea of the body horror of pregnancy is a tale as old as time. It's very easy to explore, but I think suitably captured in this. It's uh, this something from the inside of you that you don't know the origin of, uh. that people are claiming is one thing. It's not feeling right. Um, combined with everything about you being not right, it, I think I had this nice, uh, for the character, this assault from the ex external and the internal mm. and everything just being a little a little bit horrible everything is awful uh, there's moments of dream logic in this film which dip their toe into the darren aronofsky mother verse but nice. no way near like yeah, that's yeah. a 10 this is like a three but okay. we sort of we do do a little bit of yeah. dream logic jump scare jump scare moments um so like something about the statement that this film makes is very modern inflected, despite it sort of being an old film. This, this idea of ownership of women's bodies, of uh, religion, patriarchy, uh, external forces trying to control what you do with your body and how you determine as a woman, that is very sort of pointed and clearly coming from a modern day context. Yeah. And I think you'll watch this film and very see it as a, a, a moment in the 2020s. You'll be like, yes, I totally see why this film's being made. I can see why a modern young actress has chosen to take on this mm. film and, and tell it in the way it does. It is, a, it is an 18 rated film and my god is it one of the most 18 rated films I've seen a strong bloody violence understatement cool. my god okay, it does great. not it earns it it does not pull back its punches the story is more I feel like there was parts of it that were very predictable but the actual 
answer was more gory, more disgusting, more shocking than I could have imagined. Yeah. If you'd asked me, what do I think happens in this film? I just would not have pictured that we'd go there. When the final scene of this film finishes and the credits roll, my face for this entire four minute scene was this. <laughs> oh, God. Just hold it. If you're watching the video, you know the face. Just like squinted and just like, I can't believe what I watched. That's your monster munch face. Yeah, totally. <laughs> and I, I was just like, me and my cousin were just surprised of how far it went. Oh, wow. And what it chose to do and how big it, its moment is. And I just was not prepared for it. Like, you know, on the way to the final scene in Men, if you've seen it, but yeah. not quite as right, sort of okay. strange. Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, no more, thing. No but, you know, we're we're... It's not a sort of soft around the edges non conjuring verse. Yeah, this is not a film. cookie cutter horror movie. It makes a very a very clear statement and it's violent and bloody and it's competent. I enjoyed it. I think Sydney Sweeney's again showing up in lots of different things, but yeah. always being a very uh, competent part of that of that process. It's maybe a little bit cheesy, um, sort of the use of religion might be uh, a bit on the nose in terms of like creating its horror yeah because some of the scares are good but you've kind of seen a lot of them before but interesting shocking more impactful than i thought it would be wow. i thought it would be a little bit sleepy but it's not that's great yeah. i want to watch both that, yeah i'd say i'd say of the, of the two late night with the devil edges it for me but i had a good uh creepy definitely sort of disturbing time with immaculate mm. um it reminded me a bit of your review of infinity pool Oh, Infinity Pool was weirder. Okay. Infinity Pool was... I also saw it with my cousin and he'd completely forgot about that film and we were both walking out like, that was crazy. I was like, yeah, but not as weird as Infinity Pool. Okay. Infinity Pool was more... Uh, disturbing. Disturbing and obscure. That was Immaculate. Have you seen Immaculate? What do you think of Immaculate? Do you think James is wrong about Immaculate? Or do you agree with James about Immaculate? I would love to hear a spoiler-free uh, comment on the final scene. Yes. Because I think that would be worth, uh, worth hearing from the siren. So please send in your thoughts. Two... Hello, Hello. popkitchenpodcast.com. There we go. Thank you, James. That's all right. George, let's go through some of the emails that we get sent into the show every single week. If you want to send in your thoughts, your questions, your concerns, your reviews, you can send them in to hello at popkitchenpodcast.com. Just like... Iris does. Hi, James and George. A while ago, you talked about The Beekeeper with Jason Statham. And you joked about the fact that if you're going to have Jason Statham, haven't been Jason Statham. Yes. yes. We haven't seen The Beekeeper, but in it, he is... Jason Statham has earned the right... To be Jason Statham. After a long career, yes. to just get to be Jason Statham in his films. But for some reason, this movie, they made him American. And he's sort of talking like that. I'm a beekeeper. You gotta not upset the hive. Don't upset the hive. Yeah. Oh, uh, this got me thinking about typecasts in general. And mm. just as a bit of fun, I'd love to know which typecast actors are your favourites and least favourites. For example, I love me a zany Helena Bonham Carter oh, yeah. or a bumbling Michael Cera, yeah. but I can't stand a slapstick Seth Rogen or a quirky Zoe Deschanel. Mm. And by extension, are there any frequently typecasted actors that you'd love to see or think would do well doing something completely different. I think Aubrey Plaza has done some really interesting roles oh, yeah. that took her wry sarcasm from comedy into drama. Any current upcoming actors you feel could nail a switcheroo wishing you all the spring sunshine, Iris? I feel like Paul Rudd is, after having seen Ghostbusters, is just being typecast as like studio comedy schmuck, yeah. middle age schmuck. Yeah, he like, needs to be. Do the ant thing. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. I think I'd like to, well, just on, on, just on that, yeah, I, I agree in terms of, actors and their traits mm. like when you see them turn up you deliver like cage rage nicholas cage rage i'm always there oh, for yeah, that sure. we will we always love to see that i do like nicholas cage when he does something different like dream scenario but like when cage does rage like it's always fun yeah um i feel like robert pattinson really carefully chose his roles post twilight and just did a million different things and therefore he's a bit of a you could put him in anywhere. He has a very traditional look to him, a yes. handsome look to him, but you could you could imagine him in lots of different roles, which I think is fun. Yes, who's broken out of being typecast? I think um, Steve Carell, I guess. Oh, he did a great job. He yeah, did, he did yeah. Really well. I like okay. serious Steve Carell. Whenever we get mm. like a, ser a drama Steve Carell role, I'm like, oh, good. Yeah, because he, he can should do, do another one of those. I want to see him do another. Yeah, one. like yeah. a really dark, like Fox Catcher. Yeah, he did a he did a TV oh, uh, show recently. Conversation with you, the coaches, <laughs> a father. <laughs> yeah. A mentor. Um, Get the noses back on. Yeah, I love, I mean, basically, uh, I think we've talked a little bit about this before when you mentioned about Aubrey Plaza mm. shifting into doing other stuff. Always the comedy drama divide. 
any time an actor walks across either of those in yeah. each direction, I find that interesting. Emma Stone did well to graduate from Easy A and Super Bad into well, yeah, won the Oscar for Poor Things. I like to see Matthew Broderick as an action hero. No, I'm just kidding. But like, sometimes I think Matthew Broderick and like, I, yeah, Iron Man. And, <laughs> but I mean, the thing is, I've mentioned this before. But hey, Matthew, Godzilla, Matthew, Godzilla, Robert Zemeckis, Godzilla. Sure. <laughs> uh, no, that's Roland Emmerich's Godzilla. Sorry, yes. Yeah, uh, I'd see Roland, you know, Robert Zemeckis. Mm. But, you know, Matthew Broderick was, like, suave and charming and handsome. And the older he's got, the more he's yeah. turned into, like, a librarian, which is okay. fine. But, like, if you told me that he was in The Holdovers as a fellow professor, yeah. I would have believed you. But part of me feels like, oh, can you do give him something weird? Something cool. Yeah. Oh, and, like, Christian Slater, throw him in something weird. He's, I mean, he does a lot of weird stuff anyway. Yeah. Um, I feel like Liam yes. Neeson's still Liam pumping Neeson. out the uh, Ice straight, straight, straight to DVD feeling action films. Yes. It was really refreshing in like 2008 when he was like, oh my God, it's Liam Neeson. He's yeah. kicking ass. Whereas now the, the, this sort of like diminishing returns of his consequent oh. action films got less and less interesting. I love a funny Ray Fiennes. Oh yeah. In Bruges, Very Grand good, Budapest. Yeah. He always yes. delivers. I want say a bit more of I that. Say it as I said. Say it exactly yeah. as I said. Oh, the Tatuasso Cinema. Oh, yes, in Hell Caesar, of course. That's yeah. a great so, scene so in a very average film. More more, more funny Rafe, that's what I'd say. Oh, the Tatuasso Simple. Trippingly. Yeah. Trippingly. Oh, the, oh, the Tatuasso okay. Simple. Tr trippingly. No, oh, don't say trippingly. So Put your hand down. What are you doing with your hand? Thank you very much, thank Iris, for that email. This next one's from Emmy. Emmy, who writes in and says, Hi, George and James. I can't believe you haven't seen a Wim, Wend a Wim Wenders film before Perfect Days. Paris, Texas. Oh, I read Perfect Days a couple of weeks ago. Go check that out. Uh, Paris, Texas feels like a central viewing for any film buff. The final du duologue between mm -hmm. Natasha Kinski and Harry Dean Stanton is unforgettable. But Buena Vista Social Club is also a fantastic entry point to Wim Wenders films. I love the podcast. I'm not sure whether it says more about the quality of a podcast or lack of my life, but that extra day's wait to get this week's podcast was stressful. <laughs> Have a great week, Emmy. Emmy thank you so much uh, you yeah know. Vim Vendor stuff sounds great we'd love to jump in Paris Texas is just the, that big fat heavy film sat at the top of my list yeah. and I'm like it's it, I know I know it's long and yeah. it's slow okay which are two things that are a big inhibitor don't get me wrong I've heard it's great mm. looks beautiful I've heard it's stunning I've heard like I know a lot of graphic designers, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of creative visual people are always like, oh, Paris, Texas is at the cornerstone of my appreciation. I'm like, okay. Yeah. Okay, but I'll get there. But yeah. yeah. Do you anyway. think you'll watch Perfect Days when it comes out? When it comes around. Yeah, yeah sure. Like it. But I think, but then also, then it sort of settles back into the sort of eternal growing list of films I've never mm, seen. I'm like, well, I should probably just watch Paris, Texas. I think I should see Paris, Texas in a cinema though. Because if I try right. and watch that at home. Now you're delaying it by. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Prince Charles, my sure. But yeah, anyway. Next email is from Ross, who says, What's your boys? How's it hanging? Short, shriveled, and always to the left. Name the film. That is Liar Liar. No. Got you straight there. Your old pal Roscoe here, friend of the show, and Monsters University sympathizer. That's right, Ross. I do remember. Yeah. Yes. Was wondering if you've been watching Shogun. My father in law always harped on about the novel. Whenever I mentioned it, watching any. Remember, I, whenever I watched, mentioned. Whenever I mentioned watching anything Japanese, at the time of writing, there's been four episodes, and it's really great. Hiroyuki Samada is the coolest man alive, and I was shocked to see Cosmo Jarvis in a major role. I knew him about 12 years ago when he had a folk song out called Gay Pirates. It's a belter, and had a really cool music video. Um, bizarre all these years later to see him in this, but here we go. Uh, on Shogun, I watched two episodes. I thought it was very interesting, but James and I... We really don't have a lot of time to watch TV. We try to. To, to review TV. To review it as well, yeah. It's, it's easy to see a film that like we might not love because it's in and out, but it's like to commit eight plus hours I'm sure to a TV show. Yeah, I think there's 10 episodes of show going. That's, 10, that's basically 10 movies. Yeah. My other question to you, Legends, is what films do you think would be bang average if it were not elevated by an amazing oh. performance or two? I recently watched The Departed for the first time and felt oh, exactly yeah. like this without career defining, defining performances from Rachel. Nicholson, Damon and DiCaprio. I don't think it's anything special. I disagree. I think The Departed is a really good thriller. I, I agree, but I think like the, the titans <laughs> of, of the act, actors in that show really carry it and okay. take it through. Keep doing exactly what you're doing forever, please. And thank you, love. It can get always, cheesy and, and lame. if it, And also I think Scorsese helps, but like it can um, be very cheesy without good actors. I there. think Joker's bang average, but Joaquin Phoenix is amazing in it. Oh, I think Joker's yeah. great. Yeah, yeah no, I, think great. I think it's fine. Oh, people who fans of Joker 1, uh, there's a really great video with um, 
who is it? It's La- Lawrence Kerr, who's the cinematographer of Joker. He did the, it's a video, but you could listen to it like a podcast. It's like 55 minutes long. And he breaks down their process for shooting Joker and all of the different types of lenses that they use. And if you're into cinematography and to hear, like film is undeniably beautiful. Yeah. Um, please, please go check. It's on Matty Hapoya's channel. It's a really great video. And he talks about how he starts the process of uh, st- uh, uh, getting visual references for a film. He talks about it in a really sort of like easy to understand, unpretentious way but if you do understand like basic things about camera equipment and cinematography it's really really interesting mm. he's a really um easygoing unpretentious cinematographer he's clearly very talented go and check that out this next one's from elliot who writes in and says hi james and george new listener here finding your podcast while searching for reviews of the iron claw before going to see it this week the iron claw. Oh, sorry i thought you were like i just did the iron claw yeah. no, sorry uh, i've since listened back to a lot of your episodes and love listening to them on my commute as a passionate but not particularly educated cinephile i'm worried about making a good impression on the film club i've recently set up at my workplace many of my colleagues have requested we watch classic foreign language films at a club with one suggestion that we try and watch films from as many different countries as possible i'm a huge fan of british cinema with my favorite film being the 1962 kitchen sink drama a taste of honey mm. and so foreign films aren't really my forte i want to know if either of you could recommend any classic foreign language films, especially from unusual countries, that I could use to impress um, my colleagues. Unusual All the best. country. Uh, yeah. That's <laughs> an unusual it country. Really specific and yeah. difficult. It's an um, unusual country. That's a strange way. Um, don't worry about not making a good impression. Don't, don't, don't sort of sell yourself as more of a fan yeah. than you are. Just be like, I'd like to develop uh, film yeah. knowledge with friends Let's or get, colleagues. Get yeah, with everyone's. Uh, foreign language stuff you could I mean I'd go we've for we've talked about this but we are a bit you know we've seen foreign language films but it's yeah. not our uh, recently uh, Perfect Days is a great shout you could try and include Past Lives in that as a recent example Zone of Interest is technically Zone, a foreign film Zone of Interest um, you could jump into like Tarkovsky, if you want to get really arch and out there yeah. and intellectual, it's a brilliant work. I want to see more of it. What about One Fine Morning last year? One Fine Morning, Ubon bon Matin. Yeah, Ubon bon Matin. And the work of um, anyone in that field and mm. space. You could look at like um, Bernardo Bertolucci, The Conformist. Yeah, like a Conformist. Could look at, um, God, there's so many. I mean, yeah, because then it's like recent, old, recent you know. Old. You could, South Korean stuff, Parasite, The Host. Um, Parasite's a great one to kick off because it's got mass appeal. Everyone's heard of it. Some of you would have seen it. Some of you might not have. It's really good. Um, Yeah, just I'm just spinning the globe in my head here a second. Oh, Society of the Snow. Oh yes, Society Society of the the Snow. Snow, There you go. Recent, really good. Yeah, there you go. This next email is from Benjamin, who has a fantastic last name. Fantastic last name. Love it. Hi, guys. Hope you're both well. Second time emailer here. A friend of the show. A friend of the show. I'm wondering if either of you feel like doing this podcast has had any effect on your enjoyment of watching films. Do you find yourself watching them with a more analytical mind because you know you'll have to discuss them? Or do you think that has affected your enjoyment of them, for better or worse? For me, listening to you both discuss films is actually increasing my own enjoyment of watching them. That's oh, great. That's for good. example, after I watched Dune Part 2, then I listened to both of your episodes talking about... Uh, for example, after I watched Dune Part 2, I then listened to both of your episodes talking about the film. Thank you. In one of the episodes, you mentioned how much of you enjoyed how, mu- how much you enjoyed the sound design of the things hitting the floor after falling... <laughs> yes, I remember... <laughs> Trying to avoid any spoilers here. While I was nodding my head in agreement with you both, it was not something that had ever entered my mind until you had mentioned it. I went to watch June again after listening to the podcast and kept that point and it's about sound design in my mind and it made me appreciate the, the film even more. Mm. So thank you. Keep up the good work. Benji, P.S., I was always planning on watching Dune more than once in cinema. I didn't go again purely to, to see the sound design. I'm not a maniac. How very funny. Um, on that question of uh, has it affected our enjoyment of watching films, I would just say like... Yes, in a good way, but I, I would mm. say I've just come to appreciate over the past two and a half of years of doing this uh, how vital it is to see a film in the cinema yeah. and how important it is. I was having this conversation about... The Flash, for can example. I, can I... Well, sorry? <laughs> the Flash, for example. Yes, like us, yeah, no, totally. Not despising that film was totally a, a, a victim of its the circumstance we saw it in. So I, I had this conversation with a friend yesterday. Can I jump... I'm going to jump off a little bit here okay. and, and dive in a it's little your, bit. It's your film podcast. Uh, oh, it is, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. It's ours, James. So there, I was talking to my friend yesterday about uh, how going to the cinema a lot by, for doing this show has made me appreciate going to the cinema more. And I was trying to tap into why that is. And we kind of got into this conversation. I, I started to realize that I believe that for you to truly appreciate any sort of art, you have to um, 
be powerless in, in some di- in some way. The dynamic almost has to be like borderline masochistic, right? And, and stay with me you for this, right? You need it. to surrender yourself in some powerlessness. Now, I'm going to use an example of theater, film, and music, okay? okay? So the film, the friend I saw was the friend we went to the, see his play of last week, right? Okay, great. Okay, so a friend of ours put on a play last week. It was in a tiny little room above a pub, mm-hmm. and the audience was sat um, once on both sides of the room. So they were facing each other, and the actor, sole actor, our friend, was just there on the stage right in front of everyone. There was nowhere to hide. It was a very naked, mm-hmm. intense experience, right? I, I said to him about this that it felt very exciting and almost felt like true theatre compared to some of the massive shows you can pay over the odds mm. for in the West End because there's a threat there. I, we, there's a powerlessness. We've gone up there and we've surrendered. It's very uncomfortable. There's an element of discomfort in being how close we are to the stage and how intense the experience is, right? Whereas if you go to a nice cozy theatre in the West End, you're very safe. Far away. So the risk, exactly, you're, you're more detached. So the element of exposure is, is limited. Taking film as an example, when you go to the cinema, you yes, you know the film you're going to see, and they put trailers on you, watch it, whatever. But there is a powerlessness because you've had to surrender the fact that you're not going to see it at your home. You're going to see it in a room full of strangers. You don't control. You have to see it at the time that the cinema quiet. sets. You've got to be quiet. You've got to obey the rules. You've got to see it at the, at the set time. So all these things you're, mean you make yourself powerful. And again, lastly, on music, um, I was thinking about record players and why those have come back in. You know, when you put a vinyl on, you can't skip through it and you can't go as you can with streaming. I mean, that's great fun and everything. But when you put a vinyl, you are bound and powerless to the physical limitations of that medium. Committed to that. Exactly. So you put it on, you have to listen to that track in that, in, in that order. And you know, in, in 10 minutes time, you've got to get up and switch it over to side two, mm-hmm. right? So you are limited to that. But that's the point of, of enjoyment across all these three things is by surrendering yourself, by giving yourself a little powerlessness to it, that's when you open your up, yourself up to experiencing something new and enjoying it. Because if you watch a film at home, which we often do, which is fine, I understand that it's, most people don't. We you, said many times the small screen is where films live forever. Films will live eternally. Exactly. Like, that's fine. But when you think about it, if you're in an environment in which you can set exactly when you watch it, you can pause it whenever you, watch, whenever you want, Pick you can phone. check your phone, you can answer the doorbell, mm. you probably will. So there's no element of risk, so therefore it's not exciting. And I'm like, that's, that for me is the secret ingredient. So whenever I, I think, it doesn't matter what film we're seeing, whether it is The Flash mm. or Ghostbusters Frozen Empire or, or you know, Killers of the Flower Moon, I'll always want to see it in the cinema first because I know that's the prime way of enjoying it. You can also it. say receiving a perfectly cooked meal at a restaurant and it being put down in front of oh, you. yeah. Instead of ordering a takeaway. Instead of just like, I'll pick picky bits. And yeah, it's like, yeah. This is being made and they garnish it at the table and blah, blah, blah. I'm not yeah, saying... And like, there are plenty of films that you go and see and you think, I probably could have watched that at home. Mm. But it, but to use that analogy I've used before about the home and away thing, it's like, you've got to go see the film on the film's terms We've first. also spoken about like, same with putting the, taking the record off and changing it. The process of saying, I'm going to go to the cinema today, taking yes. the journey to go and walk in, buying some snacks, walking down that dark thing that takes you down yeah. to the cinema. It is all about the process of like stripping the external world and bringing exactly. you in. And You're, then leaving and thinking about the film on your way home. Yes, it's, you are you are being bound and you're committing. It's an element of Love commitment. But that's, that's so just to get back to that email, in terms mm. of how do we experience, do I experience films differently? And all art, I'm like, oh, sorry, one more mm. thing. And in the same way that I could lay out for you the the the, the, the entire artistic work of Leonardo da Vinci and you'll go, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. But if I make you go to a museum mm. and there's a reason that art galleries are- You can Google the space, image it. Let's get laying out. You can yeah. Google image it. They're yeah. not, these, these aren't just paintings hanging on a wall. They're curated spaces that are meant to affect yeah. your, your movement throughout the space. Mm. And you're surrendering yourself to being in that physical environment. Anyway, that's what I think. We love the cinema. We do um, love I'd the say, cinema. compared to how I watch films pre-podcast, my internal voice is louder. Mm. I was. All, I always did have an internal voice when I was watching, but because I'm conscious of the actual, like my internal yes. voice will have to come an external voice at least once a week. I have it going louder and very good films uh, tend to, my voice tends to sort of go away for a bit because yes. I'm just experiencing it. Whereas I do find in the bad films, my internal voice is really loud because it's, I'm, yeah. it's just it just naturally comes to me to think about like, God, this is bad for this reason, this reason, this reason. So I think it's just, it's louder. You're, but you're, if yeah. something's really good, I'll start going in my head about it. But yeah. And you're almost scrabbling to find... Uh, something interesting to say about yes. it. I like, okay, I guess yeah. I could talk about this. I guess I could talk about what that. What could be actually very distracting is if you just feel very middling on a film that doesn't really take you in any way. 
and there's nothing really yeah. coming from within me. That could also be distraction. I was like, oh, I just don't really have much to say from this. I've got to say something mm. about it. Should I even say it? Talk about it? Because that can be very distracting. Um, Which yeah. you'll hear about when we talk about Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. Yes. <laughs> anyway, uh, next email. This next one is from Ryan who says, hi guys, I'm writing this email on a Friday night after watching Interstellar on my laptop next to a pile of schoolwork that I've neglected for at least three days. That's well, just how Chris Nolan intended Chris it. <laughs> if you could actually actually put the laptop on the pile of schoolwork, uh, it really sort of opens up the dimensions. Chris Nolan doesn't know why, but he just had a heart palpitation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, you know, when, you know, when Alderaan gets blown up, yeah. that Kenobi's like, yeah. I sense a disturbance. Many great voices cried out and were immediately silenced. Oh, yeah. That's what just happened to Christopher Nolan. Uh, while watching the film, I kept saying to myself, how does Christopher Nolan write these lines of dialogue? Which you'll say Jonathan Nolan co-wrote that film as well. Uh, the question also pops up every time I watch a Tarantino film. So my question is, who is your favorite writer-director in the film industry? In your, who, in your opinion, is the best at adapting words that they seemingly pull out of thin air into cinema? I hope to hear from you guys soon. Love from Malaysia, Ryan. Do you mean, Ryan, who's the best scriptwriter who can take a pre-existing work? Or do you mean who's the best writer who can write a script and then direct it themselves? Directors, people who do different kind of things. Greta Gerwig? Yeah, she's great. Uh, I, lo I love the mind, the twisted mind of Alex Garland. I'm looking forward to seeing his new film Civil War when that's out. But he just, like, I just think it's weird. And yes. Went to my school. But did he? Yeah. Okay. Um, that's all. <laughs> uh, Rice director. I mean, um, Tarantino, obviously, one of the best out there. But all, yeah, I mean, he's, but he's, just, he's of his own style, isn't he? He's like there. Yeah. I mean, um, uh, to directors. I think there's probably, I think it's, but there's probably more than you realise. There are plenty of directors who are also involved in the writing, but maybe if they're not auteurs, you don't mm. immediately go, oh, there's a writer. To, like Noah Baumbach, great writer director. Oh, yeah. Richard Good Linklater, shot. usually writer, writer director. Yeah. Uh, not always, but sometimes. Todd Haynes is. I'm sort of thinking. You try to think of films. I'm like, oh, was that an adapted screenplay? But do you count it? We talked about before about like the process of taking a screenplay and committing it to film. Yes, is is an art it to, into itself. It did Christopher Nolan write any of? He must have done. He obviously wrote. He yeah, wrote, yeah. But Jonathan Nolan yeah. is, is co-written co it. So there we go. Guys, thank you so much for sending in your emails this week. They're always great to hear from you guys. If you have your thoughts, questions, concerns, reviews, statements, anecdotes, please send them in. To what possible reason could you have to not write in? That's a Mitchell Weblet reference. Um, please send in your thoughts to hello at popkitchenpodcast.com. There's a great Mitchell Weblet sketch called What Do You Reckon? You Is know the one I mean when they're on the news. It's like... What, please send in your thoughts of what you reckon. It could be anything, even if you don't reckon something. It's, uh, I can't do it properly, but it's really good. Um, yeah, uh, on to the games. As always, Pop Kitchen. Oh, no. on, <laughs> I'm melting. George, let's end the show with, with a game. I'm in two different sections at once. George, as always, Pop Kitchen ends with a game. With a game. I have two games for you today. We've got the name three in six seconds. Great. I, I'm starting to get good at this. Film related. He says. Name three in six seconds. Variable difficulties. Two rounds of that, you said. I think I've got, I think I've got two rounds of it, considering. Great. Yeah. And then I also have Ooh. the condensed guess the film from the cast, but I'm only going to give you three cast members. Oh, you yeah. You have to tell me what the film is also within a short time frame. How many? Social media. How many I, I think we've got two rounds of that and two rounds. You've got four games today. Great. Game time, baby. Let's get going. We're going to start with the name three in six. <sighs> okay. George, are you ready? I am. Well, no, not really, but I'll try. Please feel free to play at home. George, you have to answer these questions in six seconds. Name three Keanu Reeves movies. Matrix, uh, Matrix 2, am I allowed sequels? No, no sequels. Matrix, Point Break, and uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula. Yes, name three films starring both Al Pacino and Robert De Niro. Righteous Kill, Heat, and Godfather Part 2. Yes, name three actors who directed themselves in a film. Say again? Name three actors who directed themselves in a film. Uh, Maest Bradley Cooper and Maestro. Yep. Um, uh, Bradley Cooper and his star is born. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, uh, well, technically Martin Scorsese, he's in because no, of- No, 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 okay, okay. <laughs> Name the first three Pixar films. First three, uh, Toy Story, yes. Bugs Life, Toy Story 2. Yes, well done. Name three filmmakers who are no longer with us. Oh, uh, Alfred Hitchcock, um, uh, um, uh, 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 Alfred Hitchcock, uh, uh, um, Stanley Kubrick, <laughs> Time. and somebody else. My God. Name three Jackie Chan films. Oh, uh, Rush Hour. Yes. Rush Hour 2 and Rush Hour <laughs> no 3. No sequels. Name three films based on roller coaster rides. Uh, well, Pirates of the Caribbean, 
Jungle Cruise. Yes. And not Jurassic Park. No, no, no. obviously not. <laughs> not That's not a real theme park ride. No, but they make a joke in it <laughs> about sure. the uh, time. <sighs> name three Tilda Swinton films. Uh, 3,000 Years of Longing, uh, Michael Clayton, and Burn After Reading. Yes. Name three actors who were former wrestlers. John Cena, Dave Bautista, The Rock. Nice. I actually did that all in one go, but you, we can cut it into two socials. Yeah, do you want to... Yeah, do you want so, to, you did very well. Al Pacino, Robert De Niro. Yes, you yeah, were. Answers yeah. are Heat, Godfather 2, Irishman, Righteous Kill. Yeah. Uh, three actors who directed themselves in a film. Uh, answers I put down were Bradley Cooper, George Clooney, Ben Affleck, Woody uh, Allen, and yeah. Clint Eastwood. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Ooh, ooh, ooh. yeah. Then we've got Jackie Chan films. Surprised you didn't get any. Not seen any. Not we've got Rush, Rush Hour, which you got. I've, I've chosen the whitest, <laughs> the whitest films. The Tuxedo with Jason oh, Isaac. Of course. Oh, The Tourist. Wasn't there? Wasn't there yeah, the, the, uh, it was the, the tourist? Foreigner. It was called The Foreigner. foreigner. Um, the Karate Kid remake oh, <laughs> with yeah, Jane yeah. Smith. And I think he's in Kung Fu Panda. Do you know what I it is? Because my is. mind immediately thought of all the, the non English language yeah. Jackie Chan films. And yeah. I was like, well, I've not he's, seen he's any done films. loads he's huge. of films. Yeah, icon, yeah. Um, three films based on roller coaster rides. Kids have had Pirates of the Caribbean, which yep. you got Jungle Cruise, Haunted Mansion, oh. Tomorrowland. Uh. I think Mission to Mars. Mm. I think Tower of Terror. Um, you got Tilda Swinton, and yeah, Restless. That was good. Good fun. Right, moving on Tough. to. The guess the film based on three members of the cast. Okay, George, as I said before, you have to guess the film based on three members of its cast. I'm going to do two. I'm going to actually split A speed these up. round of Cast's Countdown. I'm going to split these up now. Cast this countdown on on fire. Yeah, let's just split it there. Is that a new ring you're wearing? No, I've had it for the, the, the bear and the the, the dragon and Remus. Oh uh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I've had it for you. Oh goodness. Ready? That's okay. The source of your power. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. 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 Yeah. George, are you ready? Mm, yeah. Do I guess. two rounds of this. You have to guess the film from its cast. Ready? Timothy Spall, Ken Watanabe, Tom Cruise. The Last Samurai? Yes. Sam Elliott, Wes Bentley, Nicolas Cage. No, I don't know. Knight Rider. Oh. Liv Tyler. You mean Ghost Rider? Sorry, Ghost Rider. I meant Ghost Rider. Uh, Liv Tyler, Ben Affleck, Bruce Willis. Armageddon. Yes. Nick Moran, Jason Fleming, Jason Statham. Um, Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels. Yes. Oscar Isaac, Kate Blanchett. Russell Crowe. Is it Robin Hood? Yes, from 2010. Well done. That was the first round. Whew, yeah. Good. Tricky, isn't it? Pre Oscar Isaac, Oscar Isaac. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're not, we're Oscar, wow. We did not, not what we knew an Oscar Just Isaac. Just Guy. Today. Just Guy. Oh, okay. Ready? Yeah, I guess. Next round. You have to guess the film from its cast. Three, two, one. Tim Roth, Helena Bonham Carter, Mark Wahlberg. Uh... Uh, oh, uh, Planet of the Apes. Yeah, Tim, Tim Burton's, Burton's one. Planet of the Apes. John Voight, Angelina Jolie, Daniel Craig. That, is that one of the uh, Tomb Raiders? Yes, is it 2001. The, is it the first one? Yeah, Daniel Craig's one. in it. Yeah, oh, yeah, he is. I'll get back to that. Lena Headey, Heath Ledger, Matt Damon. Brothers Grimm? Yes, oh, yes, well done. Uh, Terry Gilliam. Danny DeVito, Danny DeVito, Louise Fletcher, Jack Nicholson. Um, one flew over the cookies nest. Yes, done. So, because oh, Louise Fletcher was at belly and anything else, but yeah, sorry, go on. I was gonna say, I was you know just googling films, googling films, 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 and I thought, oh, John Voight and Angelina Jolie in the same film, actual father playing and father and daughter, real father and daughter, and I see Daniel Craig is in Tomb Raider two thousand and one, and I had no idea. I then was like, is he in it? And then I YouTube scenes in the film. He's totally in that film. But as what? As like with? the guy. As the bad guy. I was like, no, he's like the... I, I've, not, I've not seen this film since 2001. The love, love interest. Yeah, like love interest, companion. Oh. Totally in this movie. Can you can we, can you yeah, see a picture, I can, please? I can, uh, please. It's a young pre-Bond, obviously, Daniel Craig. Uh, Tomb Raider. Oh. Tomb Raider. I know Gerard Butler's in the second one, The Cradle of Life. Yes, yeah. That was such a... Um, uh, see here? He's in it. It's a young Daniel Craig. So he, he is. I, saw, I see this and I see like Daniel Craig third billing. Whoa. That's very interesting. Which totally- How do you think that see. film's aged? The first it Tomb Raider. so 90s naughty. I yeah. don't care what but it's so like Lara Croft, Tomb Raider. Did you just play the games? Uh, yes, but I, I've probably dipped my toe into the originals, but I've since enjoyed the 2013 reboots. Right. I also, uh, I, I used to play the PS1 
original. Yeah, which is they fun. just put they just remastered them and put them out. On yeah, the but whenever I play it, I'm just like, well, if I, when I think back to that, yeah. I'm just like that is that is the game designed by a man, isn't it? Look, yeah, look at that. Look at that. That's not even a human. I know. It's just it's just the 2013 reboot did kind of fix that kind of thing. Okay, that good. those good. So there's 2013 Tomb Raider, which is very much inspired by Uncharted, which ironically was inspired by Tomb Raider. Yeah. Uh, and then they did a, a sequel to it, Rise of the Tomb, which is even better. Those are really great. And then, then games. and then the list of a Kanda movie tried to take inspiration from those yes, games. From that, that took the central premise of 2013 of the opening, but then did a very different thing. And it wasn't very good. And wasn't very good. Um, but Angelina Jolie, man, in 2001. Out. In 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 Tomb Raider, my God! Every, every I didn't know why I liked it, but I every liked it. Ma- male between the age of eight and sixteen had a poster of Tomb Raider on, on uh, their wall. Yeah, it was also one of the first DVDs I ever had. That and the yeah, Mummy Returns. DVDs, yeah, I remember going to the Virgin big. Mega Store in Reading cool. and getting Sirens on Our Own. You know, at this point, also like DVDs were very expensive. Well, not very expensive, but they were just more than they should have been. Format, yeah. You get them in a crappy plastic case and you put them in and they'll be like, we've got special features. You're like, what are the special Whoa. features? We've got the trailer yeah. and the <laughs> teaser trailer yeah. and the international territory trailer. And a trailer for another film the studio is doing. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Do you want to see a preview of what's coming next in summer 2002? Yeah. Sure. Well done for getting um, the Tim Burton 2008 film from 2001. Yeah. yeah. Because two thousand eight, so because Helen and the Bottom of Carter and Tim Roth are in heavy yes, makeup, but not yes, but not, not not their faces. Do you know who's also in that movie? Oh, oh, mm. no, go on. Uh, Paul Giamatti as an orangutan. Oh, is he the orangutan? Yeah. Oh, great! He's there doing his thing. Oh, that's fantastic! Like, well, I, I remember that. The apes. Yeah. yeah, Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes coming out this year. We do a four, It's it's the awkward fourth. It's, you know, I think it, I think fourth. they're trying to start a new trilogy. Oh. I think looking at it, it's set easily a hundred years after the original trilogy. Yeah, not the original trilogy, the original reboot trilogy. I can't remember the title. Which film belongs to which? Is it War? Is it Dolan? Rise Dawn War? Rise, I thought was solid. Yep. Dawn, I thought was great. great. War, I thought it was, was fine. Eh. Yeah. So. Not 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 a lot of war. They are. I know it was a trilogy, but they don't. They didn't really feel like the, the, each next film had to happen. No. Do you know what I mean? They all sort of finish. Yeah. It's like if we make another one and it does well, we'll do another one. Oh, is it a good one? Oh, is That's it a good probably one? on purpose. So it doesn't miss. You know, the audience yeah. feels included. But yeah, but almost like nice case of trilogy. Real story. That, Andy Serkis, great in it. War, good in everything. Andy Serkis. Uh, yes, totally. And Woody Harrelson. Yeah. Andy Woody Harrelson is a guy I love to see in anything. I just, yeah. whenever he uses something, I'm like, great. Put him anywhere. He can do funny, he Comedy, can do sad, sad he yeah. can do tragic, great. That was episode 121 of Pop Kitchen. Do you think he'd be a good um, No. I don't want that to happen. A good villain or, an, yeah. or a sidekick. Be a but I don't villain. think he would be a good superhero. What superhero would he play? He'd be like don't a, know. he could be a really interesting Lex Luthor. Yeah. Oh, that's so great. the thing is, and that's Robert Downey Jr. Let's talk. <laughs> no, yeah, that's Robert Downey Jr. Is Woody Harrison is, you got, Rust, don't ever change, Rust. I'm trying to do True Detective yeah. here. Yeah. You've got a big problem. About I want to do Woody Harrison. He is, but yeah. what a guy. He's got, he's, got, he's, got B, he's got BDE. That's what he has. He does. <laughs> Episode 121 of Pulp Kitchen. <laughs> this was. Much. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for listening. Thank you for uh, checking out the Horror Double Bill. Remember... Bonus episode coming out this week about the 80s reboot double bill of Ghostbusters Frozen Empire and Jake Gyllenhaal's Roadhouse. Did a kick there. Uh, check out all of the three body problem stuff we're putting out on the channel. Don't forget to follow us on TikTok and Instagram to see things like that and also other things we're doing. Fun film bits. bites, junkets, lots fun of fun stuff. doing. Fun space, fun film creators. We're getting in there, we're meeting them. Lots of stuff happening. Mm-hmm. And you can follow us both on Instagram as well. We're on Letterboxd. Oh, well, well I'm, I'm the ambassador for Pop Kitchen on Letterboxd, yes. but it still counts. You can still yeah, follow us there. Yes. His opinions are his own. The opinions yeah. are my own, uh, <laughs> but but I am the gateway, the Pop Kitchen gateway to yeah. Letterboxd. I should really do it soon. Yes, I think It'll you should. A down week, it's happening. It's fun, it's it fun. fun. Everyone yeah. I tell to get it, then it spends fun, three weeks going, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and they come back and they go. Here are my four favorites. Yeah, here are my four favorites. Yeah. Anyway, Love it. James, anything to say to the people? But thank you so much for listening. Like and subscribe. Hit the bell. Mm. Uh, follow us. All that. And just tell your friends and tell your family. Oh yeah, tell share. people. Accidentally tell people. drop it into the biggest WhatsApp group chat you have and be like, "Oops, sorry, but by the way, this is a great podcast I've recommendation. To a really good new film podcast. Sorry, Gillian, this is actually to plan your wedding, but." Mm. Inflate us into the chart. Thank you everyone for listening to all the June content. That our June episode is now our third highest ever listened to episode, June part two episode. So thank you. Thank you guys and have a great week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.